All right. Thank, thank you, everyone, for, for coming today. <laughs> and uh, thank you, uh, Helen, for inviting Jacob Penner uh, to give a talk today on scaling soil carbon as natural climate solution, opportunities, challenges, and markets. Uh, so Jacob works for the Nature Conservancy. He is the Agriculture Carbon Specialist for TNC's Global Carbon Markets Team. And in that role, he supports TNC business units, regions, and key partners to implement high-quality carbon projects around the world. So not just locally, he's part of a global team. He has a master's in biology from Syracuse University. Uh, where he's worked on grasslands and grazing systems and over four years experience developing and verifying carbon projects on grasslands and croplands. So of great interest to what a lot of us uh, do and are pursuing. Uh, he lives here in Lawrence now and he's going to be presenting to us today on his work. So thank you for coming. Awesome. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Helen. Thanks, everybody, for having me. Very excited to, to be here, see some familiar faces. Um, and yeah, talk about uh, my work. So um, just a quick overview of the agenda that I'll go through today. I want to tell you a little bit about TNC for those of you who don't know about us. Um, and then I want to talk about this idea of natural climate solutions, which is a scientific framework that TNC has really advocated for in, in recent years. Uh, we'll transition into an intro to carbon markets, which I think of as sort of applied natural climate solutions, if you will. And then specifically talk about the role of soil carbon um, in carbon markets and how markets have been developed to sort of take advantage of um, opportunities uh, related to soil carbon. At the very end, um, I'll do a brief case study of one of the projects that I'm working with uh, on the ground um, in Africa. So, a little bit about the Nature Conservancy. Um, it's a global environmental nonprofit. Our mission is that we work to create a world where people and nature can thrive. Um, it was founded in 1951 with, uh, here in the U.S. Um, and originally the model was um, much more that of an organization that's buying and conserving land and, and owning land. And that's still part of what we do, but it has really grown to be a whole lot more than that also. So now uh, the Conservancy is active in every state and then 79 countries worldwide. So it's a large global conservation organization working on lands that we own, working on lands and landscapes that we don't own where we're just trying to um, uh, advance conservation goals. Um, and to do all that, there's I think about 5,000 staff by now, over a million members and donors um, around the world. Some of you probably are among those, so thank you for that. Um, and, and so, yeah, it, it's a big organization. Like, like Sarah said, I work for um, the Global Carbon Markets Team at the Nature Conservancy. That's not the Kansas chapter. Um, Kansas chapter does great work, and I'm a huge fan of, of them, but I'm not technically part of, of that team. So I'll talk about the work that I do do on the global team. Um, and the focus is really around efforts to harness nature and use nature to address climate change. So our messaging is pretty simple here at the top line. Um, nature is an essential part of the climate change solution. Um, and to really advocate for this, uh, TNC has done um, some great research to advance this idea of natural climate solutions and really quantify and estimate the actual impacts that nature can have uh, to, to mitigate and uh, to mitigate the climate crisis. So there was a seminal paper that came out back in 2017 from several Nature Conservancy scientists that introduced this idea of natural climate solutions as any action that uses nature to avoid the emission of greenhouse gases or capture and store emissions that are already in the atmosphere. So sort of a, a two-pronged approach there. But by doing this global analysis and estimating the impact um, that these natural climate solutions can have, um, the estimate was uh, reached that 
um, NCS can contribute more than a third of the emissions reductions that are needed by 2030 to achieve the goals uh, of the Paris Agreement. So there's huge potential there. Um, one of the figures came out of that paper, um, I'll just include here. Um, time on the x-axis, global carbon emissions on the y-axis, you see our trend with historic emissions increasing. Um, were we to continue to do nothing, um, our business as usual emissions would continue to increase. Um, and, and what this highlights then is the uh, impact that natural pathways can have in addition to um, the, the needed reductions in fossil fuel emissions too. So I'll say this several times today, but natural climate solutions are not a substitute for um, fossil fuel mitigation, of course. They're a complement. Um, and this figure does a really good job of sort of illustrating how, if we deploy these pathways effectively, we can reach that two degree Celsius pathway that is um, part of the, the Paris Agreement. So the paper dives into these pathways in a bit more detail. Um, and, and so what this figure shows is the specific ways in which nature can help us address climate change broken out by different habitats. So we're looking at different pathways in forest systems and ag and grassland systems um, and wetland systems too. And so um, you'll, you'll notice all sorts of things in this figure. Obviously there's um, a large impact to be made um, from, from forests and reforestation efforts from the avoided conversion of, of, of forests, especially tropical rainforests. Um, in agriculture and grassland, um, there's all sorts of different pathways there too. You'll notice things like uh, biochar, which is the pyrolysis of crop residues and incorporation of an organic um, fertilizer, essentially. Um, lots of different grazing pathways with various impacts, um, avoided grass, grassland conversion down there at the bottom. Um, and, and with wetlands too, obviously all sorts of different pathways depending on uh, the ecosystem that you're working with. Um, but there's a cost component here too that's, that's worth mentioning. So the different shades of the bars represent um, the, the approximate cost um, of, the, of, of the mitigation potential. So low cost are solutions that we think can be deployed for um, less than $10 uh, per metric ton, um, which is quite cheap. The lighter gray bars are, are thought to be achievable for less than $100 per ton. Um, and then the white bars are the maximum potential that um, you know, it could be quite a bit more expensive. So there's just a cost component embedded in all of this that's part of sort of the work and, and the message behind this concept. Um, and then also, of course, the co-benefits too. This shouldn't come as any surprise to any of you, but so many of these pathways come with the other co-benefits in addition to just the positive impact on climate, there's positive impacts on biodiversity, on air quality, water quality soil fertility. Um, so the impact is, is, is huge, of course. There's a paper that came up a few years later uh, that dove specifically into the role of soil carbon within these pathways. So this is the same figure, but summarized now by those pathways where the mitigation comes from um, either increases in soil carbon sequestration or avoided emissions from land use change um, that would soil carbon reserves. So these actually occur in all three habitat types. A lot of the times when we think about soil carbon, we're maybe just thinking about agricultural lands and grasslands, but of course there's an important component. Um, soil carbon is an important component of, of wetlands and forests um, as well. So in total, this is roughly 25% of the total um, natural climate solution mitigation potential coming from soil carbon, as it's been estimated. Uh, in forests, it's 9% of the total potential. Crop and grasslands, about half. Um, and in wetlands, nearly three quarters. And again, this includes avoided emissions and increased um, sequestration. Uh, in crop and grasslands, for example, the other half, just in case you're curious, would be um, uh, reduced emissions from improvements in fertilizer use, let's say, reductions in fertilizer use, or maybe if we're talking about um, rice systems or, or flooded crop systems, uh, methane emissions from, from those um, habitats as well. Important point, though, is that obviously uh, there's a lot of potential for soil carbon to contribute to 
these overall um, climate mitigation pathways. So hopefully that's useful framing for um, this potential of nature. Uh, but I still want to sort of explore this concept of a natural climate solution a little bit further. Um, when we talk about this, we sort of see various misconceptions and misunderstandings of what actually constitutes a natural climate solution. And so there's a paper that, again, TNC scientists put out just earlier this year um, that really sort of distills this idea of a natural climate solution into five foundational principles that you can see here. So I'll go through each of these. First being nature-based. So a natural climate solution um, is something that results from the human stewardship of ecosystems. Uh, it's an intentional management decision that's made um, to change the trajectory um, of, of an ecosystem and, and increase its sequestration potential. Um, the second piece here is that a natural climate solution would not, should not move an ecosystem further from its natural state. It's an important one, I think, especially um, for us in, in Kansas. Um, you'll recall from the previous couple slides that obviously there's a huge mitigation potential from uh, forests and from tree planting. Um, but uh, this foundation, this principle sort of would argue that any effort that is planting trees where trees did not naturally occur. It's not a natural climate solution. It's pushing an ecosystem farther away from its natural state. It's not properly harnessing the power of nature to, um, to mitigate climate change. So no tree planting in grasslands. You all know that, but some people, some people still don't. Um, second piece here is that they be sustainable um, so uh, natural climate solution should sustain biodiversity. Again, no tree planting in grasslands that's gonna disrupt biodiversity for all sorts of grassland uh, dependent um, wildlife. Um, these solutions should sustain food, fiber, and wood production. That's an important piece of, I think, what we wanna consider a natural climate solution. Um, obviously, we all depend on food, fiber, and wood as part of our uh, uh, everyday lives. Um, and so any activity that disrupts or decreases that is uh, in all likelihood just going to lead to increased production of those commodities elsewhere. So um, any activity that's decreasing that, um, that production of, of those essential products is, is not sustainable. Um, and then the third piece, uh, fourth piece, I guess, being that natural climate solutions should sustain climate adaptation services. And so we shouldn't... Um, we, we should expect to see no decrease in the ability of an ecosystem to provide resilience to things like floods or soil erosion or storm surge, um, if we're gonna call it natural climate solution. Next piece here is um, that uh, climate solutions are additional. This means that um, a climate solution provides an additional climate mitigation that would not happen without intervention. This is an important piece that we'll see later when we talk about uh, carbon markets too, is that um, any action that is taken and, and counted as a natural climate solution should be an intentional action that's done for that purpose, not something that just would have happened um, anyways. We also need these solutions to provide durable mitigation. So if we're talking about increased soil carbon or increased woody biomass in a forest, it shouldn't be something that we increase for five years and then just expect to be reversed. Um, five years from now. Um, we need durable, um, as permanent as possible, uh, storage um, of, of emissions and avoided emissions um, to, to bend that curve and, and realize the full potential of nature. Um, and then these solutions should not be used to compensate for readily abatable emissions, back to what I talked about earlier about us needing to take drastic uh, steps to reduce fossil fuel emissions too essentially what this is getting at. They need to be measurable, should be able to quantify their climate benefit as consistently as completely as possible. The accounting should be conservative. We'll talk about carbon accounting a lot more later. Um, where there is uncertainty, we should uh, be transparent about what that uncertainty is in the measurements that we're making. Um, and in some cases flag certain pathways as emerging if their uncertainty is larger than their expected impact uh, or forecasted impact might be. And there should also be no uh, double counting. 
Um, and so by double counting, I mean sort of the assumption that multiple pathways can be um, deployed syn uh, synchronously, simultaneously, um, that may not be inherently incompatible. So for example, you're not going to necessarily do uh, an improved grazing project on the same plot of land where you would do a reforestation project. Those aren't hand in hand, and so we shouldn't count for the same potential of those practices on the same land. Last but certainly not least uh, is that natural climate solutions be equitable. They respect human rights and especially respect indigenous self-determination. There's obviously um, a, a, a long history um, of injustices associated with the management of natural resources. Um, and, and it's crucial to, to do better with that as we attempt to, to mitigate climate change. Um, and, and by uh, by doing that, I mean uh, going through processes to demonstrate free prior informed consent for any project um, with the communities whom it's impacting. PNC, I think, does a very good job at this. We have multiple experts on our staff that specialize in this um, engagement and communication with, with the people in the areas that we work. So it's a foundational concept here. So. Hopefully you're convinced by now that there's large potential here. Um, but how do we realize it? Basically what I've presented so far is really these global studies, um, these, these GIS studies essentially that are mapping the world and, and assuming some sort of standard rates of change and saying, wow, look at how much we can, look at how fast we can save the world if we do everything everywhere. Um, doesn't work that way, of course. And so, so how do we realize this potential? What can we do to actually deploy these climate solutions? So that's where carbon markets come in as, as one tool of, of several to accelerate the adoption of natural climate solutions. So I like to think of carbon markets as applied NCS essentially here. Um, it's a simple concept at a foundational level, supply and demand. Um, where um, we're, there's the opportunity to pay for performance. Carbon projects are activities on the ground that are supplying these NCS outcomes uh, to companies that are demanding them, um, governments too. So there's increasing demand from governments and businesses who are looking to reduce their emissions um, and for emissions that they are unable to reduce, uh, in some cases are purchasing um, credits outcomes to achieve these net zero um, emissions. The common currency for this market is metric ton of carbon dioxide equivalent. That's the standardized unit that just uh, communicates the um, radiative forcing of a single molecule of carbon dioxide, single ton on atmospheric warming. So just for uh, some conversion units, for example, one ton of soil carbon is roughly three and a half tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. We're talking about a ton of methane, that's 28 tons. Methane pound per pound has more of an impact on climate and nitrous oxide of the emissions that are relevant um, for natural climate solutions has the biggest impact, 265 times um, a ton of CO2. Those all get rolled up into a ton. If you hear about the price of carbon um, in the news, they're talking about the price of a metric ton. So a bit more just sort of about these three components, um, especially the middle one. But on the supply side, let's say, we have uh, an example project that is a project uh, in Kilimanjaro in this case. And so it's a project that's planting trees in areas in Africa that have been deforested historically. They're supplying these, uh, these credits. Um, uh, to uh, meet the demand and then working through this market mechanism. So this piece is very complex. There's a lot of logos here, of course. You could probably spend a whole nother hour on it if you wanted to, but I don't. Um, the reason why it is such a mess is, is really due to lack of regulation by governments, historically, I would say. And so most of the action now is being driven by companies um, wanting to take action, and so therefore is completely voluntary. Um, and to some extent, it's been a historical wild west, if you will, um, as far as consistent rules and standards go. At its core, though, there's sort of three parties to be aware of. There are carbon standards, 
So these are groups like Vera, Climate Action Reserve, Gold Standard, um, that publish rules and best practices for how to um, develop projects, how to account for carbon, how to quantify ultimately what the impact of a project is. There are then project developers that know and understand these rules and do the technical work to develop and register projects. It's a group like Silvera. Um, project developers also make the connections with the projects on the ground and work with the suppliers to, um, to collect the data and information necessary to meet these standard requirements. And then there's verifiers as the third group that are independent third parties that uh, come in and review um, the documents prepared by the project developer, make sure that they follow all the rules of the standard, and ultimately then sign off on the um, project meeting those uh, standard rules. Astro Global on the left side is an example of a verifier. Then finally, we have the demand side. So the companies that ultimately purchase credits and claim the impact. So you'll see a bunch of logos there of companies that have purchased credits in the past. You'll also see the Norwegian flag. Um, so there's a, there's a new mechanism, part of the uh, climate conference every year at COP. Um, is discussion of this um, mechanism called Article 6, which is this pathway by which countries can trade outcomes as well as companies. So you see some countries, um, like Norway, for example, getting involved. It's not as big of a market yet, but we expect it to grow. So I really want to make the point here then that quality matters. Um, and that there's increasing recognition that the purchase of carbon credits, like I said, should only complement the decarbonization of a business's operations. It cannot replace it. Um, carbon markets are therefore only effective when combined with actions to reduce fossil fuel use. And the purchase of credits should only be used to offset truly unavoidable emissions. And that's a position that PNC very strongly believes in. Um, from the logos on the previous slide, weren't any oil and gas companies. We don't sell credits to oil and gas companies on principle, which is a good thing, I think. Um, and, and so, yeah, this, this obsession um, with quality really uh, is, um, requires there to be carbon markets that have strong standards, effective safeguards, and good science. Um, and this has been sort of a, an evolution, I would say, over time, um, based on when these markets first emerged. Um, there's been a lot of learning about how to do things increasingly better. You know, quality is to some ex uh, extent a, a direction of travel and not a static destination. Um, but that said, there have been, quote unquote, bad projects over the years that have been developed and that have come under criticism for um, the, the credits that they're selling not truly representing a good natural climate solution. Um, so there's a couple headlines there. The first one was actually uh, a TNC project five or so years ago. So we've, we've made mistakes and we've learned from them um, and, and more than ever really are beating this drum of quality being um, the end all be all because without it, we see markets that collapse from lack of confidence. So for guidance on quality, we can look back to these principles of uh, NCS, which in general hold for carbon projects too. Um, not all standards include these so explicitly, but the good ones do. And so we're seeing, like I said, sort of an evolution towards more and higher quality um, in, in the carbon market. And so what I wanna do here for the rest of the time now is dive um, deep into two of these and sort of talk through how they might be deployed, deployed for a project that involves soil carbon. Um, so specifically, uh, this concept of additionality and then measurability, um, which I would roll up into this larger notion of carbon accounting. Soil carbon accounting, best practices, talk about a couple of these steps here. So I want to start with baselines. Every carbon project must define a project activity that it will implement and then the baseline scenario that would have happened had the carbon project not taken place. 
So this definition is crucial to the eventual calculation of the credits the project generates, and it's parallel to this concept of additionality, whereby um, we're causing something to happen that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, the credit is always going to be the difference in emissions and or sequestration between a project scenario um, and a baseline scenario for each year of a project. So I have two examples to think about. The first being a project that avoids the conversion of grassland um, to cropland. Um, and so even though it effectively is a hypothetical, it's important then to think about the climate impact that this conversion event would have had. Um, and so we can do that graphically. Um, just by an example here, we have project year on the x-axis, soil carbon stock on the y. Um, and so for this avoided conversion example, you see the conversion event um, uh, happening at year zero, after which point um, we, uh, we assume that carbon stocks would, would drop off. Project scenario then avoids that conversion and would keep soil carbon stocks at a similar level. And we can measure this. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but then ultimately the credits that would be issued to a project that's doing this is the difference between uh, the orange line and the blue line after the project starts. So for another example, we can talk about, uh, let's consider the addition of a cover crop to a conventional crop rotation. Maybe in this case, the baseline is increasing for some reason, um, doesn't necessarily matter what, but just as important that we are um, estimating and quantifying the impact of that baseline scenario. And then the intervention adds this cover crop into the system that slowly increases soil carbon um, over time as well. So again, the credit just becomes the difference between the two um, over time. So with those two scenarios defined, Another important step is to identify all of the greenhouse gases, uh, gas pools and sources whose emissions that the project activity is going to impact. So the scale of this assessment is typically limited to the land that the project occurs on. We're not thinking about upstream emissions or downstream emissions necessarily, just emissions that are occurring on that plot of land. But almost always here, there's more to account for than just soil carbon that's gonna have an impact on net greenhouse gas emissions. So to talk about our two examples again, um, under the avoided conversion project, let's say that we are planning to graze and burn the grassland under the project scenario after we avoid its conversion. Um, there's gonna be emissions associated with those uh, practices um, that are not occurring in the baseline scenario. The baseline would have been cropping. Um, so there's emissions with enteric fermentation, the methane uh, burps from cattle that are present, um, manure, uh, emissions from manure deposition, uh, and then also some emissions from burning of the biomass. And so those need to be accounted for to some extent, and, and or they need to be accounted for, and to some extent they will offset um, the carbon that's gained from uh, the avoided conversion of the grassland. For our cover crop example, Maybe our cover crop allows us to use less fertilizer, and so we'd have higher fertilizer emissions in the baseline than we would in the project. Um, but if that cover crop is leguminous, let's say, um, it may also lead to a marginal increase in soil nitrous oxide emissions. And, and so all of that needs to be accounted for, and the net impact is gonna be sort of the resulting calculation of the net impact. So if once a project boundary is defined, each greenhouse gas that's included needs to be quantified. And uh, in the markets that exist today, there's different methods that are allowed for different greenhouse gases. Um, so for soil carbon, there's a choice between uh, measurement followed by modeling versus just pure measurement and remeasurement. I should say the modeling side, there is also remeasurement that's required, but you can do modeling in the interim. Um, 
Other sources rely uh, only on IPCC emission factors in some cases. Um, uh, and, and for some, you can use a model only, never for soil carbon. Uh, it's interesting to sort of see these. This sort of reflects the understanding um, in, in the carbon uh, market world, I would say, of where the most uncertainty is. So um, yeah, if you talk to a soil scientist, you'll say, yeah, there's an amazing amount of uncertainty in soil carbon. You need to measure it. You need to measure it well. If you talk to a livestock specialist, they'll probably say the IPCC emission factors for methane emissions are just are, are bunk. They're super uncertain, but that hasn't really made it to, um, to the market systems. And, and so that approach is, is still allowed. Different methods for different greenhouse gases. I'll talk specifically about soil carbon, though, um, since that's my area of focus. Uh, and, and so to highlight then that the purpose of soil carbon measurement is to determine soil carbon stocks at the start of a project and then change over time. Um, so with our cover crop example here, you can sort of see just the black arrows where you would want to have some sort of sampling event. Um, so we're sampling at T0. And again, five years down the road um, in the project scenario, if you have set up a control plot for your baseline scenario where you don't implement the practice change, you can sample there as well, five years down the road, um, and, and use that to determine what the impact of the intervention has been. The typical um, design that we see is a stratified random sampling design. The sample density um, is, tip, is a minimum of three to five composite samples per strata. Um, and that's just a minimum. Um, a lot of people in the industry want to see prescriptive requirements. They want to know how many samples they have to take. Uh, the standards haven't gone that far. Really what they've done, which I think makes a lot of sense, is built in this uh, sample density, uh, this, this trade-off with sample densities and uncertainty deductions that projects are required to take. Makes sense, right? The more samples you take, the more confident you are. Um, the less uncertainty there is, the less of a deduction you'd have to take. So it really allows projects to sort of balance those costs of sampling with um, the uncertainty deduction that they would ultimately have to take. As far as the sample analysis goes, um, projects are collecting cores to a minimum of 30 centimeters depth. A lot of times um, we advise them to go much deeper depending on the, the soil type that they have, the practices that they're implementing, where they expect to see change in carbon levels. Um, measuring soil carbon content, bulk density, gravel, if gravel is present, if they're rocky soils. Um, talking to Sarah earlier, you all do all of this just here, which is great. Um, and then reporting carbon stock changes using um, a method called equivalent soil mass that controls for changes in bulk density and isolates truly only the change in carbon. So that's measurement. I want to talk a bit about the modeling side too. So the purpose here is to estimate um, pools in between sampling years, in the case of soil carbon, or greenhouse gas fluxes for hard to measure gases like nitrous oxide and methane. So primarily the models you see used in this space are process-based biogeochemical models, things like Century, uh, DNDC, Rothsey, if you've heard of those, um, that really simulate the mechanisms um, that are uh, leading to carbon um, entering the soil and sticking around. Um, models should be transparently validated with measured peer-reviewed data. This is absolutely essential. Some projects, some standards don't go this far and they suffer because of it. Um, and, and so what I mean by validation um, is this test of a model ultimately resulting in just a simple scatter plot. How well does your model predict um, change has been measured and reported in the field? This is an example. It's, I don't often see scatter plots that are that nice. Um, it'd be great if they were. Um, yeah, where, uh, but what that, what this plot allows us to do again is quantify the prediction error with a certain model. Um, and that 
error can then be quantified and, and propagated to the credit estimates at the end of the day. So again, we have this really uh, elegant, I think, uh, trade-off that we see that incentivizes higher quality models. If you have a model that um, has less prediction error, you're going to have less of an uncertainty reduction. And just to talk once more about uncertainty then, um, uh, there's of course uncertainty depending on the approach that you use, um, embedded in every approach. And so good projects are going to be transparent about all possible sources of uncertainty. Um, that are relevant to their quantification approach. Things like sampling error, it can be model prediction error. In some cases, depending on the measurement method you're using in the lab, there's an expectation that you account for that uncertainty. Um, but ultimately, all of this rolls up into a single distribution that represents the uncertainty in the project's impact on the particular greenhouse gas source or pool. So that uncertainty can be represented as a probability distribution. And a good carbon project or a good carbon standard will require you to conservatively account for that uncertainty in your final credit volume. So the approach that I'm a fan of is this idea of an exceedance probability um, that essentially says you have to quantify your, um, you, got, you have your distribution and you will be credited at a standard percentile that reflects in this example, let's say a 67% probability that your project is being undercredited versus a 33% probability that you're being overcredited. So you can put that line wherever you want based on your appetite for, uh, for, for risk. Um, the current sort of standard that we see is that 67th percentile. But again, it incentivizes projects to really focus on reducing their uncertainty so that if, you know, in these two examples, it's the same mean value, but the credit value is different. Uh, and, and, and higher for the project that has a smaller uncertainty than the project with a large uncertainty. All of that really rolls up into this final table that the project is working to generate um, that calculates the final credits that are available. So to use this avoided conversion example, we have a row for each of our greenhouse gas pools and sources. We have a column for the baseline and project scenario emissions, and then the credits before deductions as the difference. And then the deductions themselves depend on the specific greenhouse gas that you're talking about. So in this example, we're taking a 20% uncertain deduction for soil carbon. Um, there's this non-permanence buffer deduction, which I didn't really talk about, but is essentially um, uh, an insurance pool that projects have to pay some portion of their potentially reversible credits into to ensure against the risk of that loss. So that's another deduction. Um, and then it all sort of comes out uh, in that final column, credits after deductions, where you're uh, being credited primarily for changes in soil carbon, um, but also accounting for impacts that you're having on other greenhouse gases. So in conclusion, I want to use an analogy here of my grandma's recipe box um, because I feel like what I've talked about, what I've tried to talk about here is, is what the recipe is for a high quality carbon project. Um, it's a quality recipe and we should feel excited, I think, that we know what to do um, as far as developing a high quality project goes. We need projects with strong baseline scenarios, a complete greenhouse gas boundary, um, and transparent quantification methods and uncertainty accounting. There's still a significant barrier, though, for all of us to hook up carbon projects in mass, and that is that the ingredients remain expensive. So I didn't talk about this in too much detail, but some of these ingredients are really expensive. Good model validation data that tracks changes over time that you can use to test your model with is few and far between. It's focused and concentrated um, here in North America and Europe, much less so in other parts of the world. Soil carbon measurements are expensive to make um, as well. So there's a lot of research into how can we um, do that more cheaply without sacrificing accuracy, or at least knowing how much accuracy we lose by doing something in the field. Um, it's expensive to collect all of the data on the specific practices 
uh, that are being implemented on the ground. Um, that's no small feat, especially when you're working um, with people who maybe haven't been uh, collecting data on their management practices historically. Um, and then also the appetite for long-term behavior change. A carbon project ultimately requires you to commit to some, some new trajectory, some change in how you've been managing uh, the land and on, and, and committing to that over the long term to actually see the, the mitigation potential, the climate benefit realized. So it's ultimately a question of opportunity cost. And that opportunity is defined, of course, by the price that a ton of carbon will fetch in the market. I haven't talked about that much. It's not really my area of expertise. Um, in general, prices range around 10 to $30 per ton, which is too low for a lot of people to, um, to, to, to make these changes. Um, it is climbing. Uh, there's a belief and an expectation that as more and more companies are pressured to take climate action, that there will be increasing demand and credits will fetch higher prices. Um, and, and so we hope to see as that happens that more high quality projects come online to meet that. So I want to end here with a case study for a carbon project that I'm actively working on. Uh, called the Northern Tanzania Rangelands Initiative. So this project is being developed on rangelands adjacent to Serengeti National Park in Tanzania in partnership with uh, the Maasai people who live there. So the Maasai have lived there, of course, for thousands of years. Their livelihoods depend on livestock. Um, but they've seen declines in the health and productivity of their rangelands over the past hundred years or so due to global economic pressures um, that have resulted in a shift from nomadic grazing that follows rains across large landscapes to more sedentary lifestyles, permanent settlements on smaller plots of land that lead to continuous unplanned grazing that depletes grass reserves and ultimately soil carbon. So this project is, is neat in that it has focused first and foremost on securing legal land use rights for these communities in Tanzania. Even though they've been there for thousands of years, there wasn't really a mechanism for the government to recognize uh, their actual land ownership um, until 20 years ago, maybe. Um, and so that's sort of the first step in securing their right to, to manage this land in the government's eyes and, and be able to make decisions that impact um, uh, the opportunities, that um, the financial opportunities for, for their people. So with those rights assured, it empowers them to think about how to manage their livestock at a landscape scale, plan grazing in a more strategic and communal way, like they historically did. And so the hope is then that this improved grazing management will start to rebuild soil carbon stocks, which can be minted as credits if they're monitored using the methods that we just talked about. Those credits, of course, would allow the communities to profit from their improved management. In addition to the other benefits, those other co-benefits that practices like this would bring about. So it's a project not without its challenges, of course. Um, it's in a region where there has been some uh, studies on grazing impacts on soil carbon, but none of the like great high quality data sets that um, we'd like to see. So part of what we're doing is setting up some of those studies to monitor those impacts over the long term, partnering with uh, government organizations, soil uh, universities um, who are doing soil carbon monitoring. Um, and uh, yeah, setting that baseline so we can track what happens over time as these practices um, go forward. There's a really big team involved in this effort. Most of them are on the ground in Tanzania. I just get to look at some of the data and advise on how the design gets set up, but it's still an exciting project to be a part of and I think illustrates the interest in um, these kinds of projects um, in, all around the world, not just here in the US. So that's all I have. Thanks for your time. And I'm happy to take some questions. Kelly. What is the management burnout? What, what will be Yeah, so it's a great question. 
um, within these uh, the, the 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 land that's now um, legally recognized, um, the planning is working with these grazing coordinators that are members of the communities to um, set up these grazing blocks. So there's a photo of the map there. You know, they're establishing here's the block where we're going to go in the dry season. Here's the block where we're going in the wet season, um, and uh, bringing together herds from multiple families to move um, strategically and planned throughout that landscape as opposed to individually and independently. So it's, um, it's establishing those blocks, it's opening and closing them depending on when and where it rains um, and, and planning that out in advance essentially. Have any examples of projects here in the US? Yeah. Um, not that TNC has been involved with. There are other companies um, that are doing projects here in the US. The one that I'm most aware of is a company called Indigo Agriculture. Some of you have heard of them. Um, theirs is a more uh, conventional cropping project for like cover crops um, especially and incentivizing projects like that tnc has done some avoided conversion projects in grasslands i think there's one in oregon one in montana um, I'd, I'd love to see us do more of those uh, as a as a as a grasslands person by training um, there's obviously a lot of loss due to crop conversion um, especially in the upper Midwest and here, I imagine, too. Um, so that's an underdeveloped model, uh, I think, in a lot of ways. Oh, yeah, you had a question. Yeah. That's a good question. Um, so there are rules. It, it, it sort of depends on the different standards. So in the case of like a cover crop that's an invasive plant, some standards will require you to demonstrate that your intervention is not introducing any invasive plant. I think most will, actually. So for that specific example, there's safeguards um, that are intended to prevent that sort of activity. The other thing that I didn't really talk about, but is still important, is this idea of, um, of leakage, um, which is, uh, let's say you wanted to do a grazing project where you were going to reduce the number of livestock in an area to relieve grazing pressure. Um, that may result in climate benefits on that specific chunk of land, but it may also lead to increased demand for livestock that are no longer there that just moves them somewhere else essentially. So that's an important component that projects have to be aware of and um, sometimes take deductions for if they expect their activities to actually increase emissions from somewhere else. Um, so yeah, the, the view is to try and um, be as holistic as possible and make sure that what's reported is truly the additional climate impact um, for the global atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, I hope they are. I, I think that's another project type that I feel like is under um, underserved and underdeveloped um, from a carbon perspective. Obviously, like CRP does good work to move cropland back into grassland. Um, but yeah, I, 
a lot of the inquiries inqu inquiries that we get are around like changes in management on a specific habitat type. Like we have a grassland, it's, it's still a grassland. We wanna change how we manage it and increase soil carbon. That's a lot harder to do than impacting soil carbon through like wholesale land use change of cropland to grassland or avoided conversion from grassland back to cropland. Um, so I do think there's a lot more potential with that kind of a project model than a lot of the improved grazing or improved cropping projects that um, people tend to think of first. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to see more of that. The one argument that I do hear sometimes is this leakage piece again, though, of taking cropland out of production in mass and you're just gonna shift that conversion pressure somewhere else. Not as much. Um, it's an interesting point though. I, I mean, like by marginal lands, you're just talking about like the 15% the of a field or whatever that has historically been under yielding. Yeah, I mean, I think that's where sort of these projects are costly right now. And so working on smaller fractions of land just doesn't really prove out um, right now. I mean, maybe if you were to aggregate a bunch of instances like that, it, it would. Um, there is, uh, yeah, interest in um, these organic amendments like you're talking about. I, I mentioned biochar earlier. I don't know much about biochar other than some people love it and some people <laughs> think it's unproven. Um, but yeah, there's there's interest in that sort of thing. The, the leakage question sort of comes up there again, especially if you're bringing in large amounts of organic material from somewhere else. Um, so it has to be sort of a net positive impact um, on, on carbon stocks. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it really comes back to this idea of additionality and what would have happened had nobody done anything. So um, that avoided conversion model really only works in places where there is widespread or rampant, if you will, um, conversion of grasslands into cropland. And there's just market pressures that uh, continually mean that grassland gets, gets plowed up. Um, but I guess ultimately, like every carbon project has this baseline scenario that you're quantifying credits against. And that baseline is always hypothetical. If you plant a carbon, or if you, if you plant a cover crop, for example, on a fallow cropland, you, you don't know, or uh, the baseline where you wouldn't have planted that cover crop doesn't exist, but that's still sort of the, the mitigation decision that you're making. And so it's important to sort of estimate what those emissions would be. And so the same thing applies to avoided conversion where you have to demonstrate um, for those projects that there is market demand for um, cropland in this area, that like the land value of your grassland would be higher as cropland than it would be had it not be converted. Um, so it's like part of this argument that, that has to be made based on the pressures in the landscape around it. Yeah, one more. 
Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of research into that side of things, and I'm sure some of you could tell probably tell me more about that. Um, in general, there aren't really pathways for remote sensing um, quantification of emissions that are allowed in a lot of these standards. I think that um, the consensus is that um, they're they're uncertain and unproven, and for better or worse, like. Uh, very much the mindset that like physical measurement is is um, above all else uh, is is the norm in the industry. So um, remote sensing for it to be used has to be shown to be as good or better than measurement, um, which at you know a small scale I think is a challenging thing to do. Over a landscape, it may work um, better, but a lot of times the small scale that a lot of these projects are dealing with. Um, it's unproven. What it is more useful for, though, is monitoring actual practices that um, uh, can um, feed into models or demonstrate that you're doing what you said you were doing. So you can remote sense whether somebody planted a cover crop or not. You can remote sense whether a burn occurred. Um, and, and so there is a role for remote sensing within this whole pipeline, just not necessarily for the emissions quantification piece at the end. 